Come on, let's give, let's give the Lord a big praise together, amen? Thank you, guys. Today we're continuing in our series, uh, Why Did Jesus Come? Why Did He Come? And today I'm going to be speaking on this subject, From Another World, the God-man, Jesus, who came from another world to our world. But before I do... I just want to double mention some of the things that have already been mentioned. Men's breakfast this Saturday. I can promise you a great, great breakfast for all of you guys. We've got pancakes and bacon and eggs, and we've even got fruit for those of you who have retired from bacon and eggs and pancakes. So it's just a great time together, a great time of fellowship. Uh, go ahead and put that up. That's up there now. Go ahead, guys, and, and uh, take a picture of that. What kind of code is that? Is that a QR, CR, JR, BR? I, can, I never can. There's so many codes nowadays. Anyway, take a picture of that, that mumble, mumble, mumble stuff there and, and sign up now. And also, I just want to mention, again, Easter will be a day of baptism. We're going to have baptism on... And my, my darling friend and yours, Cindy, is getting baptized. Cindy's back there smiling right now, so we're all excited about that. And I just want to give you a quick health update. My family's been saying you need to tell everybody how you're doing, and so um, I'm doing okay. Now I'm going to move on. <laughs> now, uh, when they worked on me the last time, and I don't, I don't like to talk about me, so please understand that's why I'm reluctant to say anything or a whole lot about this, but, um, but they, they discovered a spot on my sternum, and they're, they're nuking that with radiation right now, and so I've been through that before, and God took care of it, and he's going to take care of this again, and I'm going to be good. Y'all going to have to put up with me a long time, amen. Uh, Thank you, thank you. That makes me even feel better. I almost got healed just by that. <laughs> I want to go, would you stand with me? And I'm going to read again from Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and this time from the English Standard, the English, uh, the ESV, the English Standard Version. Isaiah 53, who has believed what he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep who have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before the shares is silent, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered him, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide with him, this is the Father speaking, 
I will divide with him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. That's you and me. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and takes and makes intercession for the transgressors. We know that this is an Old Testament prophecy about Jesus and how powerful, powerful it is. Father, we thank you for your word today. And uh, we just uh, bask in this scripture today, in this season, when we celebrate the resurrection and we look at your purpose and your will and coming to this earth. We give you all of the glory. We give you all of the praise today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So I want to speak from uh, another world. The God-man came into our world. His world was different than our world, the world of heaven. Different values, different approaches. The message that he came, preaching the kingdom of God, ran uh, counter to the things that we believe and the attitudes that prevail among humanity. Imagine the, the offense of the incarnation, a holy and a righteous God comes among normal and common humanity, broken humanity, defiled humanity. He had to deal with so much. Even his own disciples that he chose, they didn't understand him, didn't understand the message, didn't understand what he was preaching, didn't understand what he was teaching. You've got impertinent uh, Peter, the impetuous guy, the guy that was always uh, ex uh, opening his mouth and exchanging feet, so to speak. Well, one time they go into a village and they don't accept him, and so they said, there's no room here, the hotels are full. And Peter comes back, what should we do, call down fire from heaven? <laughs> and just zap them all. And Jesus says, uh, you don't understand what spirit you are of. Uh, you're speaking out of another world, and it's the world of Satan, but I come from another world where we love people who reject us. Think of Simon. Simon the Zealot, he's called. He was a freedom fighter. He was a smoking gun Simon. There was a, there was a, even Jesus had a redneck Louisianian in his, uh, in his crowd. You know, I'll give you five seconds to repent and accept Jesus or you're out of here. Matthew. The, the mathematician, well, we only got five loaves and two fishes. He says, no, feed the multitudes. So Isaiah looked ahead. He saw the one who would come. He, would, he saw in advance how his attitudes, his responses to all of these things that happen in this world would be different than our responses. And he gave us a picture of what it's like when heaven meets earth when uh, his response, when there's the clashing of two kingdoms and his challenges, the challenges that he faced, his responses are so different from mine or yours. And I want to give you three of those responses just from the scripture that we read here. Number one, it says that he was despised, yet he responded with love and forgiveness. There in verse two or three. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected. He was despised. That's hated. Hated and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He was hated without a cause. You often wonder, why, why was Jesus hated so much? Well, we know that he, he challenged religious traditions he challenged the hypocrisy of the religious people, the legalism, the misuse of authority, and so forth. He declared himself to be the son of God. They hated that. And then he ate with outcasts and sinners. He ate with normal people like you and me. And leaders were threatened, and they feared that they would lose their influence. But how did he respond? He said, Father, forgive them. Those words on the cross, incredible. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And out of my humanity, I say, what do you mean they don't know what they're doing? Of course they know what they're doing. <laughs> they're pretty obvious, pretty obvious what they're doing. But he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know. And he taught this. He taught this to his disciples. 
One day Peter comes to him. <clears throat> it's written here in Matthew, the 18th chapter. Well, you're telling us to forgive and all this love stuff. Well, Lord, how often should I forgive? I mean, I've got to be a limit to this. How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In one of the other gospels that says 70 times seven, the same day for the same offense. 490 times Hey, just basic, basic. You you forgive limitlessly, aren't you? Aren't you glad for the power of forgiveness? A, a power. I mean, it's a powerful thing. If you can forgive, and if you can, you can because God gives you the strength to do it. You're going to tap into the most powerful thing on the face of the earth to be able to forgive. You see, when a sin is committed, a debt is incurred, and someone must pay that debt. Someone must forgive. When I forgive, what I do is I, I pay that debt that someone else has incurred. And how am I able to do that? The moment that I forgive, God shores up my resources of forgiveness that extends all the way back to Calvary because forgiveness on the cross covers all of the debts of sin. So when I forgive, I tap into the limitless resources of heavenly power as the sacrifice of the cross replenishes my supply. The Bible teaches us that there is faith and there is hope and there is love, <clears throat> and the greatest of these is love. And every now and then somebody will say, love, 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 love. All I hear is this love, love, love stuff. Well, Jesus came and he preached love, 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 love. He gave us all this love, love, love stuff. He says the greatest of these is love. Love heals, love forgives, love forbears. Love puts up with others. Love is power. There's a passage that comes from John, the 11th chapter, when Jesus has heard that Lazarus is dying and he stays where he is and he comes after Lazarus has died and after they buried him. And by the way, when he comes back, he, he comes into the city of Bethany. It's not a real happy crowd that meets him. They're upset. Mary won't even come. Mary, the one who served him, loved him, the one that was the just loved Jesus, loved to sit at his feet and be fed the word. <laughs> she had nothing to do with him. If you had come, he wouldn't have died. Martha meets him. If he had, if he'd come, if you had come, he would not have died. But then he stands before the tomb, and notice this: it says that Jesus wept. Now there's a lot of uh, a lot of people ask, what does that mean that he wept? Why? Why? Well, the crowd said, "See how he loved him," and I don't think that they were off. I think that he did love him. But some of them said, well, could he not have uh, uh, kept this man from dying? He opened the eyes of the blind. It says here, Jesus once more was deeply moved, and he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. So they took away the stone, and then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I want you to make that connection today between the love that Jesus had, the compassion he had for others, and the fact that the Father heard him when he prayed. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, and, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And then when he had said this, he called out, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. It's something that I, I wrote a, a, a few years ago, several years ago, for a publication. And... Um, I, I, I discovered, I've, I've read this a couple of times, but I'm going to read this again. This, 
It was uh, something reminiscent of something in our history. And, uh, but I wrote, so I, it just helps for me to read it directly rather than try to quote it. So I, here's what I wrote. I happened upon something regarding the relationship between compassion and healing prayer a few years ago. When our kids were little, we were pioneering a small church in Salt Lake City, Utah. Funds were limited. It is embarrassing to admit, but we didn't have medical insurance. Frankly, we had to trust God if anyone in the family got sick. Our daughter, Juliet, was six years old at the time. She came, became terribly sick with flu-like symptoms, running a high fever, chills, and so forth. And Delia and I knelt by her bed and prayed for her one night. Nothing seemed to change. It was one of those lonely and desperate moments when parents go through, that they go through when they see their children suffering. Delia left the room to tend to our son. I became quiet and just sat there by Juliet on her bed. I looked at her sweet, expressionless face. And I thought about the suffering that she was going through. And then something happened beyond the fear that this could be something really serious, beyond the sense of personal failure, beyond this feeling of abject defeat. I suddenly became overwhelmed with a a, a deep sorrow for her as she lay there enduring the aches and the pains. It was an emotion so intense that I just began to weep quietly, and deeply. And as I wept, I thought about her predicament, and I thought about our predicament, living in this um, dilapidated parsonage, alone in the struggle of life with this sick little child. All of this compounded into a passionate, indescribable, unutterable travail deep within my spirit. My, my prayers reached a level of extreme, quiet travail. If you can understand that some of you have been there before. But I'll pause here for a moment and say that was just a very poignant moment. It was very deep. I was sorrowful. I was weeping. I was looking at her. I was watching her. And then I was burying my hand, my head in my hands. And I was, I didn't want to cry aloud, but I was weeping. And suddenly I felt her hand on my arm. Daddy, she said, I'm feeling better. I checked her forehead. The fever had broken. A few minutes later, she was asking for something to eat she hadn't been eating. Delia and I were rejoicing. This may seem like a rather insignificant victory to some, but for me, it was a milestone. It has served as a model for healing prayer many times since. When Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus, he wept profusely. I believe that he was overcome by the whole situation, the sadness and the heartache of Lazarus' sisters, his revulsion over the power of death, because it also says that he was angry and that had entered into humanity through sin. His love for Lazarus, the unbelief of the crowd, he wept, he travailed, he cried out to the Father, and then he performed an incredible miracle. Jesus came out of the grave. I've never raised anybody from the grave but I pray that my, my prayers would be healing prayers. I just pray that. I ask God for that so many times. And maybe the reason why is because I don't love enough. Perhaps the compassion doesn't come, but I come to him and I say, Lord, I want your love. I want your compassion. Would you give me that deep compassion that drives me to travail for somebody who is in need? That's what Jesus had. That's what Jesus did, forgiving and loving That was the kind of love that he had. His love was not some kind of passive acceptance of people where they were. Sometimes when people say, all you talk about is love, 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 they think that love is just simply accepting and not not dealing with the issues. But love gets in there and deals with the issues. Let me go to the second one that I see in this passage here. Can I hear an amen to all that? Good. It just helps, you know, amen every now and then. Somebody will wake up on the front row and say, well, not front row, but I mean, I'm right. He was rejected, but he responded with acceptance. The Bible says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Uh, he was rejected. He was despised and rejected. 
There's nothing about him that caused us to desire him. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. One who people hid their faces from him. And I know that that's probably speaking of him when he was on the cross. But we also have to understand, even as Kenneth spoke about last week, that his appearance was not, uh, it was a Hollywood appearance. He did not have, <clears throat> he did not have that presidential look about him at all. I remember in my childhood, um, I, I had, I guess you could call it a, um, an inferiority complex. And and because uh, I, I experienced uh, rejection. I don't want to make you feel sorry for me because I don't like it to be all about me, but I can tell you that I was rejected quite a bit <laughs> by my peers. My mother made my clothes for me. That was the first problem because everybody else got stobot clothes and my, my clothes were made by my mother. My mother, when she made a pair of breeches, she made them, oh, a couple of three sizes too big so they would last a while. And, so, you know, that'd be kind of up around, they called me armpit spall. You know, it'd be up around my armpits. I had to unzip to blow my nose. And... Big old pockets, you know, which was kind of cool because you could you could put frogs in there, lots of marbles. You could you could there's all kinds of stuff that mom found in those big pockets, and she would, you know, the, she'd have to put a belt on, <laughs> and she pull that belt. That's why. I, so I when I was about six years old, I had this kind of an hourglass figure. I had a <laughs> beautiful teenage girl figure right there because you pull that tight and. And then suspenders. What are the suspenders for? And, but I, she sent me to school, first day, suspenders. And I got there, and I looked around. Nobody had suspenders on except for Francis, and he sat under the desk all day. And so <laughs> I went home midday, lunchtime, and I took them off. First rebellion I ever remember. I just told my mother, I'll never wear those again. Not, not. And I didn't. That was it. No suspenders. No suspenders for me. But, you know, things like that compound over time, and, uh, and you're in far to inferiority complex. It's just, it, it was just not, uh, I, I suppose, you buck up and you take it under the chin. Um, uh, there, there's a lack of psychological awareness for many parents, I think. And my mother, she, you know, it, it, it didn't bother her, you know. My, her brothers wore suspenders back in the 30s, and so... I should be okay with that. But I was not an athlete. I just not very good at stuff. I, 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 just, I just wasn't. I was the last one chosen. Usually I wasn't even chosen. I just became a part of that team by default. You know, you choose, 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 choose. And um, perhaps you have experienced rejection. Can I share this with you that whatever rejection you have shared, the Bible says that he was despised and rejected by men, and he took that rejection upon himself. So there's a place where I came to understand that I was accepted in him. Ephesians, the first chapter, the sixth verse, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted. In the beloved. That word accepted in the King, and I'm, I'm, I'm using the King James Version because uh, I like that word accepted, but it means more than, okay, <laughs> you're the last one on my team. It means more than you're the first one on my team. It means, it, it, the, the Greek term is charitu, which simply means to bestow extravagantly upon someone, to give extravagantly. God has given to us. He didn't just accept us, but he has poured out extravagantly his favor upon us. He's lavished it in a great deal, not because of something that we did or that we could have done, but because of his love for us. Let me give you the third and the final one. It says that through his death, he overcame my rebellion. Did you notice that? That he took upon himself my iniquities. 
He was pierced for my transgressions, your transgressions, our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement or the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wings, we are healed. I'll try to, let me try to do something here. Let me, but, okay, I'll just turn this one off. Thank you. Is this on? And so it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That word iniquity means rebellion, rebellion. Because of the fall, we are plagued with original sin. We're all born with a rebellion. You don't sit a child down, your baby does. I'm going to teach you how to rebel. They know how to rebel. You teach them to what? Obey, not to disobey. We came into this world well-equipped well-equipped to disobey rebellion. Throughout my childhood, and perhaps you have experienced this too, too, rebellion grew within me. Everything that would happen, just a little bit more rebellion. A bad event, a disappointment, things like that would nurture this rebellion in me. And in my early teens, I finally figured it out. And it was something like this. You know what? I don't owe anybody anything. <laughs> I don't owe anybody anything. I didn't ask to be born into this world. This was not my decision. This was the decision of two other people. My mom and my dad. I think it was their decision. I might have been a little bit of an accident. I don't know. But I didn't ask to be. Nobody came to me and said, do you want to be? I didn't, nobody asked me. Therefore, I do not owe any allegiance to my parents or respect to anybody. I don't owe you anything, world. Was not my fault that I'm here? So why should I be responsible for someone else's decision? Now, that is the very rebellion that undergirds lawlessness, this word of iniquity, which means rebellion and lawlessness. This is the perspective that leads people to deny their identity, to deny their lot in life, to ask to be born in this family. This is not my decision. Their heritage don't like that. I didn't ask for it. I don't owe anything to anyone. What I failed to see was my birth was not the decision of mom and dad. My birth was his decision. And when you wake up and realize that you're in this world because it was God's decision and you're not an accident, then it changes your, enti your entire perspective. And when I came to him, this is what repentance is is laying down. Well, how can I do that? How can I lay down that rebellion? How can I lay down this attitude, this feeling of helplessness that I'm here against my own desire? Romans, the ninth chapter, the 20th verse says, okay, here's the final, here's the final thing. Here's the final way to deal with this. Who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? And we try to be something that we are not. And we rebel against what we are and who we are. Because we don't understand that it is God who is in charge, that Jesus is Lord. There's no one in this place today that is here by accident. And your plot in life, your lot in life, and your plot in life, and everything else is not an accident. You are a gift. 
You are a gift from God. You're a gift. He made you for a purpose. Let me just say this without embarrassing Cindy today, but Cindy is here for a purpose, and we wouldn't be who we are. Right, family? If it were not for Cindy, God gave her to us as a gift, and God gives to each and every one of us. He gives us to the world just as Jesus was given to the world, just as he was given. So what do I do with this feeling of helplessness, helpless choice, that feeling that leads me to one out of all of this, that mutiny against life? I come to Jesus, <laughs> and I lay it all out there before him. And I tell him, I really fought against you. I fought against you, Lord. I've never liked this. I've never wanted this. I've got rebellion. I've got hatred in my heart. And I remember the night, that one night in mid-March 1965, when I poured it all out to him and said, I hate this world, but I'm asking you to give me a love for this world. Help me to accept other people, not to be critical of other people, to hate people, to, to criticize everybody that I see. Out of my rebellion, my rejection of other people, Lord God, cleanse me, heal me. And here's the great thing about it. This is the power of the cross. Jesus went to the cross, and he bore, he bore my iniquity. So that night, the Lord, as it were, said to me, I took care of this 2,000 years ago. So as you have poured it out to me, I want you to know that I've already taken care of it. I bore the rejection that you feel, I bore it. I bore the rebellion that you have, I bore it. I bore the, 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 the hatred that you have, I, I bore all that. And now, here is my love for you. I'm going to give you the ability then to bear that rebellion, give that rebellion up to me. And I've taken it. I've taken your dirty, rotten, stinking attitude upon myself to the cross. And therefore, you are set free. Everybody say amen in the name of Jesus. And if you have that hatred today, he didn't condemn you. Good heavens, that's the thing. That's the thing about it. Well, that's just a hateful person. I have found that people do strange things out of their hurts. When I feel hated, when I feel rejected, when I, when I, when I feel that rebel, then I am going to rebel. But because he bore that, I don't have to bear it anymore. This is a load that I don't have to take anymore. I can unload all of this on him. I can give it back to him to the point that no matter what somebody does, even if, they, if what they do is wrong toward me, if they sin against me, I can still forgive them. What a powerful, powerful thing to have. Let's thank God for it together. Would you stand? Father, I thank you that no matter, no matter, no matter what kind of thing I may be dealing with today, the, the, the anger that I may be having, the anger that I experience today, hatred that I experience for this world, hatred for the things that are around me, the things that have bothered me, maybe my lot in life, sickness that I bear, discouragement that I bear, non-commitment from others that I, I see, the hurt and the pain, bad things spoken over my life, a teacher who cursed me, a parent who spoke words of defeat over me. All of that, Lord God, I bring it to you today. And I thank you that you bore it to the cross. You took it upon the cross. And so because you bore my pain, Lord, I'm not going to go through that pain anymore. I'm going to 
accept you and accept your love for me. And I thank you for that. Let that be your prayer today. If you've never prayed that prayer before, let that be your prayer today. Lord, I come to you and I rely upon you as my Lord and my Savior to completely and totally come into my life and completely and totally take this pain, this sorrow, this rejection, this rebellion away now in the name of Jesus. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise for it. And everybody said amen. amen. We're going to worship the Lord together, and as we dismiss today, we'll have some uh, folks over here to pray. If you want special prayer at the end of the service, feel free to come over. We, we love to agree with people in prayer because we, we see that where two or three agree is touching any one thing, it shall be. So feel free to come. And then at the close, we'll just have uh, Betsy, if you would close us, close us in prayer today after the song. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. Let's give God a good clap offering together. Lord, we praise you.